there's this colloquy, this conversation going on between Savitri and death. And we had read um, Savitri's answer. She doesn't take his arguments seriously at all because she has such a deep knowledge from her own spiritual experience. So all these words and ideas that he's throwing at her, they have no convincing effect. Hmm. Immutable death's denial met her cry. However mighty, whatever thy secret name uttered in hidden conclaves of the gods, thy heart's ephemeral passion cannot break the iron rampart of accomplished things with which the great gods fence their camp in space. Whoever thou art behind thy human mask, even if thou art the mother of the worlds and pegst thy claim upon the realms of chance, the cosmic law is greater than thy will. Even God himself obeys the laws he made. The law abides and never can it change. The person is a bubble on time's sea. a forerunner of a greater truth to come. Thy soul, creator of its freer law, vaunting a force behind on which it leans, a light above which none but thou hast seen, thou claimst the first fruits of truth's victory. But what is truth? And who can find her form amid the specious images of sense, amid the crowding guesses of the mind and the dark ambiguities of a world peopled with the incertitudes of thought? For where is truth, and when was her footfall heard amid the endless clamor of time's mart? And which is her voice amid the thousand cries that cross the listening brain and cheat the soul? Or is truth or but a high starry name or a vague and splendid word by which man's thought sanctions and consecrates his nature's choice. The heart's wish donning knowledge as its robe, the cherished idea elect among the elect, Thoughts favorite mid the children of half-light, who high-voiced crowd the playgrounds of the mind, or people its dormitories in infant sleep. All things hang here between God's yes 
and know. Two powers, real, but to each other untrue. Two consort stars in the moon night of mind that towards two opposite horizons gaze. The white head and black tail of the mystic drake, the swift and the lame foot, wing strong, wing broken, sustaining the body of the uncertain world. A great surreal dragon in the sky. We find some change here in the attitude of death towards Savitri and in his arguments. He has had to recognize something about her. He has had to recognize that indeed she has a very, very high knowledge. And accordingly, he makes his answer. Dana Lakshmi, you will start. Immutable sense denial made her cry. However mighty, whatever thy secret name, uttered in hidden conclaves of the gods, thy heart's ephemeral passion cannot break. The iron rapport of accomplished things with which the great gods Fence their cat in space. Mm. So immutable, unchanging. Death has not changed his denial, his resistance, his refusal of her wish and her will. Death's denial, he's going on saying no. Mm. <coughs> and he says, However mighty you are, however powerful you are, even if you have some wonderful secret name Mm -hmm. uttered in the hidden conclaves of the gods, perhaps when the gods meet together, they talk about you and they speak of you by your secret name. Even if you are such a high being as that, this passion of your heart, this ephemeral passion, who remembers this word ephemeral? It means that it will last only a very short time. Ephemera. There are. Ephemera today. It's the day. Ephemera one day. Ephemera means one day. It will last only one day. Yes, there are certain insects which only live one day. Ephemeroids. So if something is ephemeral, it's just uh, very quickly passing. So you're, you're, now you feel this intense passion and this love for Satyavan. But this is not something that is going to last. No? So that ephemeral passion of yours can't break, it can't destroy the iron rampart of accomplished things. A rampart is a big defensive wall. If you go to Jinji, uh, there are ramparts. There are these protective walls behind which the king would have his camp, his fortress, to protect him against enemies. So a rampart is a very, very strong wall. And here he's saying that the gods have a wall. The great gods fence their camp in space. They they don't let people pass that wall. It's made of of iron or it's as strong as iron. The passion of your heart can't break down that protective wall that the gods have made. 
Kamala. So again, he's saying, whoever you really are behind this mask of humanity that you're wearing, even if you are the mother of the worlds, the Supreme Mother, if you peg your claim on the realms, on the kingdoms of chance, the cosmic law will be greater than your will. To peg your claim. It means that you, you've got some point of law or some reason which is the basis on which you're making your claim. And he says, what you are claiming, you are claiming some kind of privilege for these ephemeral, these passing, transient realms of chance where things are based on... Uh, unpredictability. They're not based on reality, necessity. They're not based on law. They're based on the play of chance. But uh, the cosmic will, the universal will, will always be stronger than that. And God has made these laws and in the universe he obeys the laws that he has made. No? And here he is saying that the law abides, it remains, and never can it change, it's something permanent. Whereas the person, the individual person, is just like a bubble, a single foam bubble on this vast sea of time. What can you do about changing the law? Impossible. Don't even think about it. But then he says something really remarkable, uh, Bebel. The forerunner of the created truth to come, thy sole creator of its real law, founding the force behind on which it leads, a light above which none but thou has seen. Thou claims the first fruits of truth victory. Yes. He says your soul is a forerunner. In Oroville the first community was called forecomers. No? The people who come in advance. A forerunner. It's a messenger who runs in front of the army or the ambassador or whatever to tell that he's coming. Your soul is a forerunner. It's a forerunner of a greater truth that will come in the future. This is quite an admission he's saying, no? Something quite new from him, no? Yeah. It says your, your soul is actually the creator of its own freer law, not dominated by the laws of the material universe. Hmm? And you are the, it's a forerunner of something that will happen in the future. And what you are doing, you are vaunting a force behind on which your soul is leaning, is relying, is supported by. Do you remember vaunting, Bhuvana? We had it last week. Actually, the commonest word, uh, commonest uh, meaning is boasting. Yeah. Somebody vaunts of their prize or their, their, their strength or their knowledge or whatever. So he says, that's what you're doing. You are 
you are um, claiming this force that's what you are relying on you're saying that is strong enough hmm? your soul is relying on that and you're wanting a light but nobody but you has seen that light hmm? but on the basis of these things this force and this light you are claiming the first fruits of truth's victory the first fruits of something are always very important no that uh, the first banana on the tree we'd like to take it to the temple no? or uh, um, the first fruits we, we want to do something special we make an offering no and he says look you you are claiming the first fruits of truth's victory a truth, a, a victory that will come even in the future. You want them now for you. That's what he's implying, I think. And now he's going to question this whole concept of truth. What is truth? He's questioned uh, love and he's questioned uh, matter and many different things. Now it is truth that is challenging. And Josie. But what is truth and who can find her form amid the spacious images of sense, amid the crowding guesses of the mind and the dark ambiguities of a world peopled with the incertitudes of thought? Mm, yes, what is truth? It's a very, very famous question. This is um, when Christ was being judged. No? They took him to the, to the Roman governor. And uh, he, he, what is truth? Asked doubting Pilate and did not wait for an answer. And uh, a great stylist English stylist of the 16th century has written a whole essay on that. What is truth? How can we find out what is the truth? And even Sri Aurobindo has written about it in uh, The Life Divine. There's a whole chapter about that. How can we find out? What is truth? Who can find the form of truth? in the midst of all these specious images of sense we rely on our senses to tell us how things are but the images which our senses convey to us are specious they are misleading hmm? So those are the things that we depend on. We depend on the sense data that, gets, that comes to our mind and our mind tries to translate it. But he says even those, the mind, it's only guessing. These are crowded guesses of the mind. And you people, you human beings, you live in a world which is full of dark ambiguities. When something is ambiguous, we don't know what it means because it can have more than one meaning. Something that is ambiguous is not clear because we can interpret it in different ways. This world that we live in, he says, it is peopled with the incertitudes of thought maybe a material world but we interpret it with thought and our thought is uncertain we have a place called certitude and it's named after a photograph of the mother which she has given the name certitude but normally human beings live in a state of incertitude or we may be certain but still we are wrong no? Yes, very often happens. 
Sorry? That's so it is ambiguity. There is so much ambiguity, yes. Chandra? Cheat, cheat the soul. Yes. So where is truth? We think of truth as she. She's a goddess. No. He says, uh, who has heard? the footfall, who has heard the sound of her foot touching the ground in all this endless clamor, this terrible noise, so many different voices in this marketplace of time, a mart. So everybody's calling their wares. I've got it. I've got the truth. I've got the truth. I've got the truth. When is her voice heard amid this uh, endless clamor of time's mart? How can we tell which is the voice of truth you know, in the midst of all the thousand cries that cross the listening blame, brain and cheat the soul? The soul may be convinced and think, oh yes, that sounds true. And, uh, but it may not be. How can we find out the truth? He's pointing out how uncertain everything is here in our human world. Yes. <laughs> That's what's so nice. Here come the questions, unanswerable questions. But she will give the answers. Mila. There is truth hot, but a high is terminal, or a great and splendid world by which man's thought sanctions and consecrates his nature's choice. The heart <coughs> which do knowledge as its goal, the cherished idea elect among the elect, thoughts favorite meet the children of half life. To hide voice crowd the playgrounds of the mind. For people it's dormitories in infancy. Yes. What is truth after all, he says? Is it anything but a name? A wonderful high starry name. It's got some wonderful golden aura around it. Maybe it's just a word. A vague word, a splendid word. It's the word, the label that we put on whatever our human thought sanctions, says yes to. We say, oh yes, that's the truth. You know? And it's by that sanction, man's thought is just consecrating his nature's choice. It just depends on the choice of our nature, what we think is true or not. There are many psychologists who uh, agree with this, you know, that, that what we think is true and right, what we find convincing, it depends so much on our heredity, our education, our cultural background. You know, yeah? All these things, they determine uh, what we say. But this is the truth. How can you... No. It's just uh, the, determined by the wish of the heart. And then we dress that up with knowledge. We give all kinds of justifications. And because of this and this and this, yes, this thing is the truth. But we've really chosen it because of some kind of preference. Hmm? Or oh, it's our favorite idea, our cherished idea. Elect among the elect. When we hold an election, we choose an alternative or a person. You know? The elect are the chosen ones. So there are some chosen preferred ideas that human beings have. And maybe each one of us has our own preferred idea 
And that's the one, the truth that we cling to. Truths, thoughts, sorry, thoughts favor it. I made all these children of half-light, all these formulas and ideas formed by the ignorance. There, he says, there gives this image of all these different ideas being like children running about on the playground, shouting, you know, high-voiced, you know, or they may sleep. They may be sleeping children in the dormitories of the mind. You know. The highlight, what is it? The children of half-light? The half-light of the ignorance, the twilight. You know. Are children of the, uh, the ignorance, yes. And then there comes this very uh, symbolic sentence, no? uh, Bhuvana. All things can be between forms, yes and no. Two forms, real but to each other untrue. Two consort stars. To the moon behind that mind. The two two opposite horizons gaze. The white head and black tail of the mystic ray. The swift and the lame foot. Wing strong, wing broken. Sustaining the body of the uncertain world. A great surreal dragon in the sky. Mm. So this is a psychological symbolism. It's a wonderful picture of the world of dualities. The world of contradictions. All things here on earth, they hang between God's yes and God's no. There's the positive and the negative. There are, these are two powers. He says they are both real but each of them seems untrue to the other one. Two consort stars. Sometimes we see two stars in heaven that always stay close together as if they are married. No? But these two consort stars in this mooned night of mind, the 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 moon is a symbol of mind because it doesn't have its own light, it's only reflecting a light. You know? So the, the mind is like, so this, this is the moon, night of mind. There are these two glowing stars. Some people are attracted by one, others by another. And those stars, they are close together, they are linked somehow, they are consort stars but they are looking towards two opposite horizons in different directions. So it's like a drake. A drake usually is the male duck. The duck is the female and the drake is the male and they're often very highly colored, beautifully colored. But this word can also mean a dragon. And uh, here we have this dragon. So here what exactly he's meaning by Drake. <coughs> anyway, we can think of a, something like a great bird in the skies that has a white head and a black tail. Hmm. It has a, a foot which carries it fif swiftly. And on the other side, there's this limping foot. It has a wing that is strong and a wing that is broken. These are the wings, the, the feet, that are holding up the body of the uncertain world. It's a great surreal dragon in the skies. Describing some Chinese uh, god or something because I, I'm not aware of this uh, image of 
this image is quite unfamiliar and the thing is it's bringing together different images in, in the Hindu concept we have this idea of the hamsa the, the cosmic swan yeah. here he doesn't call it a swan he calls, or actually I think if we are literal it's a goose isn't it? hamsa, it's a goose so but here he says a drake first of all what is he describing here? He, he's describing, I think we could say what he's describing is our world of dualities in which there's a, everything is opposite and to us when we look we can think matter is primary or spirit is primary and these two things seem to be contradictory. They're like two stars looking towards opposite horizons. Or there's the opposition of soul and nature. Fundamental oppositions, black and white, broken and strong, all these things. That's the difficulty in this world and that was what makes it so difficult for us to identify anything as the truth. And of course, it's interesting that even in this uh, in this poem, it is Savitri and death who represent the eternal yes and the eternal no. Okay. So it's ironic that he is saying this. He's saying, "I am strong and you are weak." He may say it like that, yeah. But uh, to us, this is interesting because. What Sri Aurobindo is leading us to is a truth that reconciles all opposites, all dualities and oppositions. That symbol also like that, no? One is black and another one is The yin, white. the yin yang, yes. Yeah. Too dangerously, they hate how truth must love. Live. Live. In the in danger in in danger in matters, not the little messes. All in this world is true, that all is false. Its thoughts into an eternal cipher. Cipher run. Its deep self to times rounded zero. Yes. So he says, you, you are in love with some high truth. But that truth is challenged. It has to live very dangerously, uh, entangled in matter's mortal littleness. If things are tangled, entangled, like you, uh, you go with your hair on the motorbike and they get all tangled up and then you can't get the, the comb through, no? Entangled, it's, or if, uh, if your, your thread, when you're sewing, it gets tangled up, you, you can't get it untangled. No? So, he says, this truth is entangled in the mortal littleness of matter that in the world of matter everything must die no? and it's small, it's limited so what place has truth there? No? in a sense everything in this world is true in another sense it's all false the thoughts of this human mind they run into an eternal cipher. This is actually a word with several different meanings, but here I think it means the cipher zero. Yeah. A cipher is also a kind of secret writing or code you know, that we have to decipher. Yes. But it, it's also a synonym for the word zero or not. No? So all its thoughts 
When you weigh them all up, they run to nothing. Everlasting cipher. It's deeds, it's actions. They pile up, pile up, pile up into times sum, the huge addition. But when you add everything up, it all adds up to nothing. Everything gets cancelled out, weighed out, contradicted. Hmm? He's talking about truth here. He's talking about the world that we human beings live in, where it's in, in a sense impossible to uh, single out anything and say, this is the truth. Hmm. And now he's going to give some examples. Would you read, please, Narendra? Hmm? Thus, man at once is animal and God. The disparate enigma of God's make, unable to feed the Godhead's form within. A being less than himself, yet something more. The aspiring animal, the frustrated, frustrated God, yet neither beast nor deity but man. But man tied to the kind earth's labor strives to exceed climbing the stairs of God to higher things. Mm. Thank you. So he says thus, for example, man, human being, is at once at the same time an animal, we have an animal body, and at the same time a god because we have a divine part within ourselves as well. No? A disparate enigma, something that's disparate. It means the parts don't match, they don't fit together. And an enigma, we've had this word many times, meaning a puzzle, a riddle, something mysterious. So human being is a really a disparate enigma, a puzzle made up of parts that don't match, that don't fit together. And this disparate enigma is unable to free the form of the Godhead which he's carrying within himself. All of us are carrying this divine part within us, but somehow we can't disentangle it from all the other parts of ourselves. A being less than himself, when we act like brutes and animals, or worse than animals, we are less than our true selves. And yet there's always something more. The aspiring animal, the animal that wants to be more than an animal, the God, the divine being who is frustrated, unable to be and express his divine self. And in fact, human beings are neither beast nor deity, but just human beings. And we are tied, we are bound to this uh, species that earth is trying to exceed earth the, the labor of Earth's nature is to go beyond humanity to something higher. No? It's trying to climb the stairs of God to higher things. So this is also remarkable that death should say something like this, acknowledge something like this, that um, the, the idea of a spiritual evolution He's admitting the idea of at least the aspiration for a change. We'll go a little further, Joel. Objects are seemings and none knows their truth. Ideas are guesses of an ignorant God. Truth has no home in earth a rational breast. Yet without reason, life is a tangle of dreams. But reason is poised above a dim abyss. 
and stands at last upon the plank of God. Eternal truth lives not with mortal men. Yes. Objects, we think they're, they're so familiar to us, we think we know what they are. But they are just appearances, seemings. The physicists tell us that all this is swirling atoms and gas. No? They are only seemings. And nobody knows really the truth of all these form, material forms. And the ideas, even the highest ideas, they are just guesses of this ignorant God, this God of mind. Hmm? Truth has no home in earth's irrational breast. With uh, Irrational, it means without reason, without the power of reason. Hmm? Without reason, life is just a tangle of dreams. We can't disentangle all these tangled dreams of life. But what is reason? It's as if it's hanging there somehow above a dim abyss, a deep, dark emptiness, standing at last. It's got some kind of plank it's standing on over this huge abyss. But that plank itself is doubtful. Eternal truth lives not with mortal men. So let's just read to the end of his speech. Um, Leila. For if she dwells within thy mortal heart, show me the body of the living truth, or draw from me the outline of your face, that I too may obey and worship her. Then we will give thee back thy satyam. Yes. So that's a, quite a demand, no? Mm -hmm. Show me the truth. Sergei. But here are only facts and still born of law. It's true, I know that Satyama is there. And even by sleep, he has zero in that. No way to prove that there is a law. Are you stopping there? All right. Yes. Okay. It's also clear, no? Here in the earth there's only facts and steel bound law. The laws of physics cannot be changed. So Satyavan is dead and you, Savitri, sweet though you are, you can't bring him back to life. No magic truth can bring the dead to life. No. Um, Sarojini. No power of God can sell no things once gone. No joy of the heart can last suffering in death. No place for, for sure the path to live again. But life alone can show the new void and fill with the thought the emptiness of time. Leave then thy dead, so of sanity and life. And live. Yeah. So these things seem so obvious to us, no? that no power of earth and cancel something that's once been done or that has happened. And no joy of the heart can last surviving death. When we die, the heart also will dissolve. So. And no bliss can persuade the past to live again. Hmm? That's his gospel. And then he says, 
but life, life can in a way comfort this emptiness, this silent emptiness. Um, and we can fill with thought the emptiness of time. So, Savitri, you can go back to earth. You can still have some joy, some, some experience. Leave your dead behind and go back to earth. That's what he's concerned about, that she should go back. So that's where we will stop today. Immutable death's denial met her cry. However mighty Whatever thy secret name uttered in hidden conclaves of the gods, thy heart's ephemeral passion cannot break the iron rampart of accomplished things with which the great gods fence their camp in space. Whoever thou art behind thy human mask, even if thou art the mother of the worlds and pegst thy claim upon the realms of chance, the cosmic law is greater than thy will. Even God himself obeys the laws he made. The law abides and never can it change. The person is a bubble on time sea, a forerunner of a greater truth to come. Thy soul, creator of its freer law, vaunting a force behind on which it leans, a light above which none but thou hast seen, thou claimst the first fruits of truth's victory. But what is truth? And who can find her form amid the specious images of sense, amid the crowding guesses of the mind and the dark ambiguities of a world peopled with the incertitudes of thought? For where is truth, and when was her footfall heard amid the endless clamour of time's mart? And which is her voice amid the thousand cries that cross the listening brain and cheat the soul? Or is truth aught but a high starry name, or a vague and splendid word by which man's thought sanctions and consecrates his nature's choice, the heart's wish donning knowledge as its robe, the cherished idea elect among the elect, thoughts favourite mid the children of half-light who high-voiced crowd the playgrounds of the mind or people its dormitories in infant sleep. 
All things hang here between God's yes and no. Two powers real, but to each other untrue. Two consort stars in the moon night of mind that towards two opposite horizons gaze. The white head and black tail of the mystic drake the swift and the lame foot, wing strong, wing broken, sustaining the body of the uncertain world, a great surreal dragon in the sky. Too dangerously, Thy high proud truth must live Entangled in matter's mortal littleness. All in this world is true, Yet all is false. Its thoughts into an eternal cipher run, Its deeds Swell to time's rounded zero sum. Thus man at once is animal and God, A disparate enigma of God's make, Unable to free the Godhead's form within, A being less than himself. Yet something more. The aspiring animal, the frustrate God. Yet neither beast nor deity, but man. But man, tied to the kind earth's labor strives to exceed. Climbing the stairs of God to higher things. Objects are seemings, and none knows their truth. Ideas are guesses of an ignorant God. Truth has no home in earth's irrational breast. Yet without reason, life is a tangle of dreams. But reason is poised above a dim abyss and stands at last upon a plank of doubt. Eternal truth lives not with mortal men. Or if she dwells within thy mortal heart, Show me the body of the living truth, Or draw for me the outline of her face, That I too may obey and worship her. Then will I give thee back thy Satyavan. But here are only facts and steel-bound law. This truth I know, that Satyavan is dead, and even thy sweetness cannot lure him back. No magic truth can bring the dead to life. No power of earth cancel the thing once done. No joy of the heart can last surviving death. No bliss 
Persuade the past to live again. But life alone can solace the mute void and fill with thought the emptiness of time. Leave then thy dead, O Savitri, and live 